Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah Show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah July. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Our first email today uh, sent in by David. David writes in and says, hi there. With regard to HSP and HFP, Bluetooth is a nightmare on Linux. I have been tracking these issues for quite some time on both Pulse Audio and Pipewire on potential solutions to implement this. The developer who created a possible solution is a very hard-headed and opinionated individual, and as a result, the proposed changes have had trouble being accepted. This is partly because the HSP HFP methods of dual transmission of audio were created mostly for phones, not really computers. Many of the functions are specific to modem commands that do not belong uh, in a sound stack. A proposed solution in the past developed for the N900, I think, was to use a solution called Ophono. Ophono is an old, outdated, very hacky, uh, but long story short, I'm not confident that we will get good Bluetooth bidirectional audio for quite some time. However, I did see a solution. One of these online solutions that I've not tried myself, and I know you don't like to recommend solutions that you've not tried. However, it looks very promising. Instead of being a general purpose Bluetooth dongle, it is a Bluetooth audio dongle. It appears to support Pulse Audio as a speaker and microphone, but the dongle inherently handles all of the switching. And so he gives a link to this, and the link that he gives us to is the IMII USB Bluetooth audio adapter for PC. So the concept here is quite simple, right? As you connect it to your computer, the computer sees the audio device as an external USB audio device. Now, this means that we're entirely bypassing uh, Linux's Bluetooth stack. We can have that conversation in a second if that's a good thing or not. But um, then this device is paired pairing to whatever your audio device is. So if you're pairing it to a pair of headphones, you're pairing it to a headset, whatever whatever it is, and that is presented then transparently to the computer as a USB audio device. Now, anybody who's used Linux for five seconds has figured out that USB audio devices work pretty well. What you may find is that uh, sometimes Bluetooth devices don't work so well. So where I get to with that is this. Of course, we're going to have a link for you in the show notes to both the IMII USB Bluetooth adapter. And then he also actually links a uh, a creative one as well. So he's saying, hey, if you prefer a more popular brand, uh, then do this. I will tell you that, to be honest with you, uh, a lot of the quote unquote popular brands are just the cheap Chinese thing wrapped in different plastic and with a different label on it. It's not, they're not actually designing these things from scratch. Uh, that's particularly true if you're like, hey, I didn't know that KitchenAid made a USB audio device. That's strange. That's usually, that's them putting their brand on something else. Uh, uh, this, he, so this listener continues on because he has an entirely separate uh, uh, contribution, which I thought was really cool. He says, the following is a segment on drawing tablets and got me interested in responding. My daughter is... A, uh, an, an artist, and she you only uses Ubuntu. We initially set her up with a Wacom Intuos tablet, and it was an entry-level model because at the time, we didn't know if her interest in computerized drawing would wane. After using it for almost a year, she was ready to move on to a more professional model, and she wanted to use one that could be used as a monitor. She had she was very used to looking at the screen and not her hand, but she had issues with pressure points in different sizes between the tablet and the screen. The screen was smaller, and so the line on the tablet would render differently on the screen. We decided this past holiday season, it was time to upgrade and get her a better model. We searched on Amazon and researched the products for their Linux support. XP Pen came up quite a few times, and they had a driver model for Linux. Now, it's a little bit hokey in the sense that their configuration application has to be running in order for it to work. However, once it works, it works well, and I've created a policy kit and uh, file a desktop file for my daughter so that she can just simply just click the desktop icon and prompts her for a password. It does not always survive a reboot or resume, but it's easy enough to launch again. Their non-display models also have good support for left-hand versus right-hand drawing. It does matter because on the tablet, the buttons can interfere. When used as a display, there are no left-hand modes because it relies on DM to configure the display. 
I did not find a way on mirror displays to rotate one of them. If you know a way, this would be helpful. Also, extending the displays causes an issue uh, because the X gets confused with the coordinates of the touchscreen versus the monitor. But even with those few negatives, it works well, and we purchased an XP Innovator 16. This is a 1080p 15.6 matte screen with hardware buttons, and it connects over HDMI for the display and USB for the pen and a second USB for power. XP Pen also seems like a pretty good company. I sent them an email after the purchase and commended them on their support for Linux. I got a personalized reply. This, of course, is the first picture she used drawing Krita. David. And we'll have a link to that picture in the show notes. You can check it out. Uh, a huge thanks to David for writing in and sharing this with me. Uh, he's following up on a previous segment that we did on, uh, well, not really a segment, just it was a hardware pick, I think, one week, week that we mentioned an inexpensive drawing tablet, but um, picked one up for my kids and, and um, had actually thought about where do you go when you're looking for the next one up? What What's the next thing? And and I would have uh, I would have been very skeptical with, the, with trying to navigate uh, finding one that has a display. So really appreciate that, sending that in. Our second email comes in uh, from Ira. Ira writes in and says, hello, hope all is well. Just a question uh, below for the show. What is the best VPN company? I heard you speak about certain VPNs that don't have a track history uh, of turning over records, but you didn't mention what VPN does. In your opinion, what is the best VPN? Um, and that would go to private internet access. Um, and I use them not because they give any, me any money to say that. I think we do have an affiliate link at asknoahshow.com if you are so kind as to use it. But uh, the reason that I have chosen them as my VPN provider is because they have a track history of not collecting user data. And so they go into court and the people ask them, just judge will say, hey, we want these records. And they say, we'd love to give them to you. We don't have them. You're welcome to come and look. If you can find them, you can take whatever you can find. They, there's no evidence that they collect any logs. And I want to be clear, I don't advocate for VPN services because I, I have something to hide or because I'm, it's not about that. We have a reasonable expectation to privacy inside of our homes. And when it comes to your internet provider, remember, even things like DNS queries, when you're looking up at WebMD and you go to webmd.com slash, and then whatever the condition is that you and your doctor are trying to confidentially work out or whatever it is, remember those DNS requests, if you're not paying attention to it is by default probably going to your ISP and they're caching that information. And then they're selling that information. A lot of them are anyway. Uh, and so it's uncomfortable and, it, and it's people should have a better access to private internet and that's what PIA provides. And so um, that that's the internet, uh, that's the that's the VPN that I've been using for years and they have fantastic Linux support, fantastic Windows support, fantastic Mac OS support, uh, fantastic mobile clients. They even have a little... Um, a little GUI that runs inside of Linux, or you can just use their open VPN configs, jump all over the world. It's also a necessary tool, by the way, if you work inside of IT. My gosh, is it wonderful to be able to just hop across the world and say, I need to be in the UK for a little bit and test a server over here. Oh, look, that works. And this is what happens or doesn't happen. Oh, I'll jump over here over to France. Oh, look at that. This thing works in Japan. And that's fun, if nothing else, right? But it also has uh, real world implica work implications. So, Private Internet Access. You can learn more at privateinternetaccess.com. Charlie writes in and says, Hi, Noah. I just thought you'd be interested to know that open source free speech platform Minds is going to support Matrix in 2020. Minds is all in, is uh, alt into Facebook and various censorship uh, with big tech publishers. And so the idea here, it's not, I wouldn't say necessarily to, to, to rid them, but the, the idea is to allow those platforms to interconnect. And so what's being proposed is using Matrix to do that, which I think is absolutely fantastic. But I was not aware of Minds.com. I'm, I'm, again, everybody seems to be jumping on that bandwagon. So that's, I'm glad to see it. And I think, man, this week was the week where you were glad if you were taking the advice that, hey, should probably host my own platforms. Our last email comes in from Rob. Rob writes in and says, Hi, Noah. Love the show. I was hoping you'll address the recent tech censorship. I was shocked by Firefox's recent post and deleted the browser. This led me to go down the rabbit hole of how trustworthy open source is. I switched to Fedora recently, but will corporate interests affect the project? Will the web truly be free to navigate in the future? Can an independent platform such as Parler thrive on the web without Amazon, Google, and interference? Curious on your thoughts. Uh, and I'm I'm going to save my thoughts for the end of the show. I We're going to take that topic up. I'm also going to invite our interactive Jitsi room to join us uh, and, and, and offer some input. Um, but I will tell you this before I address any of that. 
Mozilla, when you look at what Mozilla has done for the web and their track history of what they've done for the web, it is good. And the other night I was using a site uh, to download a YouTube video and YouTube deal wasn't working. And so I found a site and this site, uh, I'd click on the download link and Firefox pops up and says, Hey, you, there's a pop-up. I prevented it. I'm like, Oh, that's good to know. Dismiss it. Click on the download thing again. Now that pop-up comes up this time that changes to a download link, close the pop-up again, click the download thing again. This time the video file comes up. And I thought that's Firefox taking what would have been an ad filled jump around the internet uh, escapade with what God only knows what's going to pop up while I'm sitting next to my wife in bed. Right. It's just weird. And Firefox takes that experience and turns into a little yellow bar at the top of my browser that I click on. Firefox is the company that is, 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 is constantly trying to focus on making a better web. And so uh, uh, blog post aside, we'll get to it, but I would be cautious of telling you to just wipe Firefox off of your, off of your computer. And I would tell you that because it's still a very good tool, despite your agreements or disagreements or my agreement or disagreement with their, uh, with their, their public blog uh, post, uh, which we'll have linked in the show notes. If you want to read it yourself. Our pick of the week this week is Media CMS. Now, this is a modern, fully featured open source video and media CMS. It's been developed to meet the standards of modern web platforms for viewing and sharing media. It can be built to small to medium video uh, or media platforms within minutes. It's built mostly using a modern stack to Django and React and includes a full REST API. So absolutely gorgeous UI. Really, it's, it's self-hosted YouTube. It looks like it they, you, they took the YouTube UI, completely ripped it off, self-hosted it, and put a different uh, theme around it. That's that's really about the, that's really about the, that's, that's it. But the thing that people are learning this week, if you haven't been living under a rock is that if you don't own a piece of infrastructure, then you are a guest on the person who does own that piece of infrastructure. And that person will set the rules and you will follow the rules. And so if we want the internet to be a place full of ideas, then it stands to reason that we want a bunch of infrastructure. The nice thing about the internet is we can decide where we want to spend our time. Uh, and so there's, this fits that bill a number of different ways. So my first inclination when I took a look at this is I was like, well, that's great, but it doesn't support federation. And so if I was going to set up my own self-hosted video platform, why wouldn't I want to go with PeerTube because it's federated and then, you know, you go on, then you're on the Fediverse and all the things that come with it. Then I start thinking about it. But do I really want to see all of the videos that are on the Fediverse, whatever that happens to be, and all of that entails? Maybe I don't want that. Maybe I just want to have a, a, a smaller environment where there are where all of the things on that environment I know I'm going to enjoy because it conforms to a preset standards and a preset of ideas. That might be interesting as well. Then I start thinking about all of the corporate uses that you could do with this. Companies that want to host internal training videos, families that want to have internal servers to share movies with, with families, but they want it behind a VPN or something like that. My gosh, my kids, if, if I had a dime for every time I had a conversation with my kids, no, you can't post videos on YouTube, but why? Now they can do that, right? And then mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and all those people can see those, but the wrong people can't. Uh, so there are a ton of use cases for stuff like this. And I, I've not really heard much about this before, which is pretty amazing. It's a completely open source uh, media system. And uh, so, yeah, it's called Media CMS. You can learn more at github.com slash media CMS slash media CMS. Uh, we'll have a link for you in the show notes. Those are available at podcast.usnoahshow.com. Our gadget of the week this week is the Dell WD19TB. So this is an updated version of, I believe the original one was the WD16, which was Dell's Thunderbolt dock. Now, pretty much every Thunderbolt dock that comes out, I try to get at least one in the shop to try to see how it works with Linux, how it works with various laptops. First thing I did is tried it with all of the regulars, right? The Dell XPSs, the the, the ThinkPads, Apple MacBooks, uh, works across the uh, across the gamut, uh, seems to power all of them, seems to work with all of them. Um, the thing that you get with any Dell Thunderbolt, uh, or at least their premium ones, that you don't get with other manufacturers, and this is only true if you have a Dell computer, but their Thunderbolt docks are capable of supporting a power interface up to 130 watts. Um, now, that only you only get that 130 watt power if you're using a Dell laptop. So you have to have one of their XPSs or their Precisions or something like that. If you don't have one of those, it's then 
you can't take advantage of that feature. But for their higher end precision models that require that upper power management, it's really worth buying the Dell version instead of um, any other version, really. Um, so taking around the front and the back, two display ports, as you might expect, one HDMI, two rear USBs, one front-facing USB, one rear-facing USB-C. Now, this is on the USB bus, and then one, another USB-C, but this is a Thunderbolt port on the back. And that Thunderbolt port is in addition to the built-in uh, dongle cable that has uh, a Type-C connector. So the first thing I didn't like about it is I really, I'm not a big fan of that cable being built in. I'd rather the Thunderbolt cable be disconnected so that I can swap it out if it breaks. Now, my understanding is if you take the thing apart, uh, it's very simple to swap that cable, but I've not actually tried it. Uh, and it, it just seems like it would be easier just to be able to disconnect that cable. I do, however, appreciate the rear-facing Thunderbolt pass-through port. Um, that's something that the Lenovo docks that we've previously been using didn't have. And so that was a welcome change. From the TB16, they've removed uh, one of the USB ports on the front, so you get one less USB, but still an amazing dock. Uh, works flawlessly with Linux. Um, had it running Kubuntu today. Uh, had it both. We've used it both on a Dell Precision and on a ThinkPad T480 and an X1 and a Dell XPS. So, I mean, they've on Linux, all of those on Linux and uh, working absolutely fantastic. So if you're in the, if you're in the, uh, if you're in the market for a dock, it is the Dell WD 19 TB, Dell WD 19 TB. We'll have a link in the show notes at podcast.asknoahshow.com. And again, because every time we talk about Thunderbolt docks, there's somebody that writes into the show. So I'll just save you the, the hassle. If you don't have Thunderbolt and you're looking for a dock, the Dell WD 15, that is the USB version of a dock. But of course the issue with the USB is that you're funneling all that over the USB bandwidth. And so the performance is not going to be as great as Thunderbolt, but WD 19 TB, a knockout from Dell. Really, really excited and happy with it. In the news this week, probably the most shocking story uh, in Linux was uh, from a guy by the name of Daniel Rodriguez who managed to boot Linux with GNOME on an iPhone 7. Yeah, he has a YouTube video of the phone working with GNOME as well as a complete write-up on Reddit. And again, this is what's great about the community. Not only will they do it, they'll tell you exactly how they did it. So he says that the prerequisites are you need a writable directory uh, available over NFS, including DHCP server on a local network. Then you need CheckRain, a specific version 0.10.2-beta. Um, you'll need a, a specific kernel fork, which he has linked and will have links to his uh, Reddit post in the in the in the show notes, and uh, Project Sandcastle utilities. Now, Project Sandcastle is a uh, is a is a suite of tools for uh, installing the Linux kernel and Android on I or on um, Apple hardware. And uh, then he uh, talks about the cross compilers and stuff that he uses. So essentially, the way that he goes through that is this: he st boots the phone into recovery mode uh, and installs a few packages, does a custom kernel, and he has to modify the custom kernel that he links to by hand, but he walks you through this in his Reddit post, how to modify this kernel, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, I've never done that before. And um, then uses something called Project Sandcastle Utilities. And again, this is a set of utilities for getting Android or Linux running on iPhone hardware. He did all of the networking stuff by himself, but he made a repo available for you. So if you're trying to replicate this, then you can go to his repo and he has all those scripts available. And CheckRain, which you'll need a specific version, 10.2-beta, is what, what he's using to jailbreak the iPhone 5. Although I read another, uh, another post that was saying that he didn't actually have to jailbreak the phone for this to work because the, the, the way that, the, the way that it would work is you would need the, uh, the, the actual storage of the iPhone, which is, is dead, um, which makes this story all the more amazing. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and so then again, with the iPhone in recovery mode, you launch CheckRain, use CheckRain to launch Pongo OS. You, we use Pongo OS to load the Linux kernel and then Linux kernel boots Linux mounts file system over USB ethernet. And that's, and then USB devices obviously is controlling it with a USB mouse and keyboard, that kind of thing. Um, and so this phone was originally given to him as a piece of junk by his, um, by his grandparents, I think his grandma had this extra phone said, Hey, this, she took it into Apple and they said, well, the storage device is dead. The NVMe is dead. So it's just never going to work again. And he's like, ha ha ha, sure it won't. And manages to get Linux functional on this computer. So 
the obvious aside, like that's amazing. Uh, and the other obvious aside is I kind of want an iPhone seven now. Um, I, this is what makes me so disheartened when I see that companies are making efforts to try to prevent people from loading Linux on their hardware. Um, and that was kind of disappointing to me when, when the M one came out now, it, as it turns out, there was somebody that could even get around that. And so which is out for a matter of days and we've already figured that out as well. But it is disappointing to me that companies don't actively want to do this because look at the life this guy just got out of this device. This was a thing that was going to go in the dump. It was going to be technological waste. It was junk. And it turns out it's a fairly powerful device that still can boot with the right software on it. And it's booting over a network that's capable of something that Apple never envisioned that thing was going to do. Uh, and yet here it is doing it and, and it can do that because of Linux. And, and yet Apple wouldn't want people to use their product that way. That's disappointing to me. But Daniel, uh, great job uh, setting all of this up. Now, I'll have a link to uh, both Daniel's YouTube video uh, and his Reddit post, which goes into great detail on exactly how he set all this up and got it working. Jarek Mock uh, was looking for internet at his house, but he didn't have a good broadband, so he built his own fiber ISP. AT&T's advertised plan for his neighborhood topped out at 1.5 megabits per second. So this guy is a network engineer going through life, lives out in the boonies, wants internet, can't get it, and eventually switches over to a wireless internet service provider that provides them 50 megabits per second down. Now, honestly, if I'm this guy, that's good enough. Like, hey, I've got internet. It's fast enough. It's comparable to what a lot of people would say is broadband anyway. Uh, we'll call it good. So he contacts Comcast because he wants actual fiber to his house and says, hey, uh, how much would it charge to get me better, better internet out here? And they said, well, we, we'll go ahead and extend uh, fiber, but it's going to cost about $50,000. So he thinks to himself, $50,000. I'm going to spend my $50,000 to build Comcast's network out to my house. That's essentially what they're offering him. So he says, no, instead, I'll start looking into the cost of burying fiber myself and ends up finding out that you can't just bury fiber and connect to the internet, then you actually have to become an ISP if you're going to do that. And so four years ago, that's exactly what he does. He starts planning to become his own provider. And he, he is now at the point where he has fiber to the home broadband in parts of Sio Township and Lima Township. Mach has installed five miles of fiber so far and has begun hooking up his first customers a few months ago as of early January. Mach told, uh, this article is from ARS Technica, Mark, uh, Mock told us that he had been connected. He had connected 30 homes and had about 10 more homes to wire up. He initially figured he could get about 35% of his potential customers to buy service, but it's been about 70% in reality. The customers that Mock has not hooked up yet are generally relying on cellular service. And I have seen this firsthand. We've had business customers that have contacted us and said, hey, can you get better internet out to our branch offices? We've had home internet customers that have said, what are my choices if I don't live near a populated place where I can get good internet. So I completely feel this guy's pain as a fellow person who lives out in the boonies. The problem is it's very difficult. And I would have told you prior to the story coming out and us talking about it here on this show, I would have told you that this was not possible because from what I understand of the pricing to bury small runs of fiber, when I hear that it costs $10,000 to run to every single home, I start doing the math on it. And I'm like, so the break even point is I'll be dead. No. Oh, okay. Oh, doesn't matter. Uh, so I just always figured you had to have a fat checkbook to do this. And the process has always been because uh, there are a lot of regulatory fees involved. And so to become a telco, which is the only legal way to do this, um, it's usually only possible for large corporate businesses that, um, that and, and here's the thing, they're not, large corporate businesses are rarely afraid of government and government regulations. They can sort through that stuff and they're happy to pay the red tape. What they're afraid of is the next Jared Mock. They're afraid that the next Jared Mock is going to start to bury fiber and hook up internet. And because Jared uh, makes a personal relationship with all of his customers, it's going to be very difficult for Comcast to sell them $10,000 fiber runs, or excuse me, $50,000 fiber runs into their home. I think that I think in the article it said that he uh, he could make the same run for about ten thousand. And in fact, he says, "Hey, if they would have said ten thousand, I would have said just run the fiber." But that's not what happened. And so there, this is what they're afraid of. They're afraid of this guy going forward. But that's exactly what he's doing. And my friend Mike Jennings from uh, Vox Telesis is this is a constant struggle for him and his business. 
the line gets more and more blurry as we move into IP space as to who really qualifies as a telco provider. And so a lot of solutions do tie into a telephone system like Teams and, and Zoom and stuff like that. But if they don't, they wouldn't necessarily need to be a telco. And thus, they don't have to deal with all that regulation. But he does in his, bus- you know, in his business model. And, and so, but to deliver the internet, to bury the wiper, those kinds of things, you have to jump through those hoops. And so this guy's willing to do that. He's willing to file the fees and, and fill out all the paperwork and, and, and do all of the things. And like I said, I didn't know that that was possible. I didn't know that you could do that unless you had a large wallet, but it just goes to show you that the technology is getting cheaper. The process is becoming more and more well understood. And the reality is this is a far more efficient way and a far better end result to the user as a way for the internet to run. It's part of the reason that I'm so interested in decentralized networks and decentralized communication, because it's just, it makes more sense when you have a smaller subgroup of people and those people are managing a smaller set of users and that is a, it, the lower the ratio, uh, the, the better service you're going to be able to provide. Uh, and, and anybody who's worked in customer service or business for five minutes has figured that out, um, that people aren't robots. They're not just numbers. And so it, they don't scale infinitely because we can't treat people like robots. That doesn't turn out to be a good experience. And ISPs are going to figure this out uh, or they're going to get replaced. And, the, you know, the, it's not just people like this. Obviously, this is a this is an exceptional case. This is not your this is not what most people do. Um, Starlink is becoming a thing. They're not the only ones playing in that space. Amazon has filed uh, paperwork for to, to get their satellite systems up. And so, and I'm, of course, I'm talking about in this part of the world. I understand that, you know, depending on where your geography is, this is not the case. But over here in the United States, the Internet is like running hot water. People just expect it to be everywhere. And so as you start, it, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that as you start to get out to the places where you have people that want to stay connected to the Internet, but they also don't necessarily want to live around a lot of other people. And that presents an infrastructure problem. And so people like Jared are fixing that and fixing it in a way that, by the way, is going to present a better experience for you. Because when you're unhappy with your service, you can just go tell Jared and then he'll fix it for you because you guys are friends and you talk to each other and you know each other and you guys have a relationship and you're not just customer one, five, seven, six, five. Three, two, five. Great job, Jared. And yeah, and I, I'll I'll leave you with this. Even apart from what Jared has done, and even apart from what has hap- what is happening uh, in the United States, uh, the fact that satellite internet has become a thing. You take a handful of Raspberry Pis and a satellite internet connection, you're going to change a village's life in Africa, right? So there are implications across the globe. Uh, it just it's kind of cool that somebody did that here. Fantastic. Our main segment uh, this hour is self-hosting and deplatforming, and I am going to invite our interactive Jitsi room to join us. Hey guys, welcome into the program. Hey. So I want to start by saying this. First of all, flat out, violence is wrong. Full stop. And advocating for violence is wrong. It's uh, I can't be any more clear than that. So. With that out of the way and that disclaimer out of the way, I wanted to focus and talk about the tech side of this, which I think is a far more useful and constructive conversation to have. So in communication, in broadcast, we have what is known as the gatekeeper. And it has been a thing that has been in place ever since the ability to get a message out to multiple people generally reside is, is a very limited resource. And so it's used very conservatively. And so somebody has to make the decision of what content is going to go up to the satellites that the news networks pay to host in orbit, right? Or the lines that the cable companies pay to, to run or the transmitters that the radio station or whoever, right? There's always been a gatekeeper. There's always somebody deciding. And the thing that changed with the internet back in the, when, when the internet started to come online was that gatekeeper slowly got pushed away and slowly and surely people had their voices heard or could have their voices heard. And that has exploded in the past few years to the point that nobody really agrees on how to have that discussion or manage that. Um, And so a short synapse of what happened here in, in in the past few days the president, uh, President Trump, violated the terms of. And I'm just, I am, I am staying apolitical on this one. I'm just trying to talk about the technical side. So if you don't agree, I'm trying to state this as neutrally as possible. President Trump violated the ter- terms of service as reported by Twitter, and they suspended his account. Uh, Twitter is a private platform; they can do that. Then he removed the tweets and got his account back. But the next day, his account was uh, removed permanently because he violated the terms of service again. A lot of people start switching over to Parler. Parler is an, uh, is an alternative to Twitter. 
Um, as uh, these groups move over to Parler, the activity that they are doing on there made Amazon nervous. And so Amazon says that, hey, you need to control the content of what these people are posting. This is dangerous. They can't be posting these things. Parler says, we're trying. Amazon says, we don't really think that you have the tools to try and we don't necessarily agree. So we're giving you until a date at which point we are going to shut your services off and you're not going to be able to run. So here is the, so, so the technical side there is that they were running on someone else's infrastructure and that infrastructure got pulled. You don't hear about that often. You don't hear about the fact that AWS wants to turn a server off on a major comp on a major company, but that's what happened this week or that's what is happening this week. Then it gets weirder because Mozilla puts out a blog post and this is what was referenced with the listener. And there are, are essentially, you can go through and read it yourself. Mozilla is welcome to express their opinion as I am well, welcome to express mine. At the end of the day, there are three things that they are advocating for. And they're, they, the three things are that they, they, they want people and organizations to commit to meaningful transparency on platform algorithms so we know what and how content is being amplified, to whom, and what associated impact. They want to turn on by default tools to amplify factual voices over disinformation. And they want to work with independent researchers to facilitate in-depth studies of the platform and the impact on peoples and societies and what we can do to improve things. So I'm going to bring in uh, our, 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 uh, our interactive Jitsi room and, and have this discussion. I want to start with this. So first of all, um, what, what do you guys think? Where is... Is it the responsibility of a platform provider to decide what content is being amplified or should that just be left up to the individual users? What do you guys think? Now, that's kind of a tough challenge to really kind of look at because, you know, for one thing, when it comes to, you know, what's factual really ends up being based on perspective. Mm. And that becomes a point of, you know, who are you know, Twitter or Facebook or anyone, who are they to be the arbiter of truth? Because they're looking at things from their perspective. And there's going to be things outside of that perspective that they're going to miss. You know, it occurs to me that one of the major discussion points here is how these companies got into this mess in the first place. If you're Parler and your sp or any company really, it doesn't even matter what, what the, what the service is. The reality is if you're a company and you're thinking about spinning up your infrastructure, it obviously is not occurring to these people that they have to ask the question, what do I do when the person I rent my server from doesn't want me to rent the server from them anymore? What's my plan? And then I start to ask questions. I was having this conversation with my dad earlier today. He said, well, Noah, you, you, Wind down servers all the time. The company says this, and he knows, you know, the company says, oh, this, we get a better hosting deal over here. We get that. And it's all containerized. So it's just picking things up and moving. Um, and, and so he goes, why can't they do that? I'm guessing that they didn't build for that. I'm guessing they just tied into AWS and figured we're going to be here for life. Well, they actually also have a contract with AWS and they're taking Amazon to court over right now because it sounds like the vi Amazon violated the terms of the contract. Right. So uh, it, that actually turns out to not be true. As it turns out, they didn't actually negotiate a contract with AWS. They accepted the standard terms of service, which roll over every 30 days. So Amazon gave them enough for, uh, you know, heads up. They were apparently negotiating for almost a month before they pulled the trigger and and removed them. But this, 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 but, uh, you know, we start from the shared perspective of, Amazon always held all the cards to begin with because it was their servers. And so you ha then then one has to ask uh where do you draw that line and where does that and how do you draw that line? So I w let me ask you this. When you look at self-hosting platforms and going to YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, what are your guys' thoughts? Is it is this the direction that the internet is going to move to get away from these major platforms? Or do we accept that these companies have a certain amount of oversight? They're generally well hearted. I mean, right. It's it, the, the, the reason that action is being taken is because of something really bad that happened on those platforms. Right. They didn't just pull this out of nowhere. Um, it's not, this is fairly unprecedented. Um, so do we cut them any slack? Well, I would also put bring up the point that Twitter is now also being hosted on AWS, and they get a lot more lean, 
lean leeway with regards to content on its site. Like you can actually see full blown porn and other threats and stuff on Twitter, even though uh, compared but to there's a contrast to that. The difference is that Twitter actively engages in several mechanisms in which to clean up that content. And here's something we don't know. We don't know how many times AWS has had to talk to Twitter about this too, because the thing is the difference between parlor and Twitter is that parlor um, threw the finger at AWS, whereas Twitter has actually developed more tools, added more infrastructure and hired people specifically to handle this problem. So what if as a as a platform that is offering people, you know, that offers a way for user generated content to exist, the at the end of the day, that content is somewhere and is on somebody's servers. And while whether we like to think of it as being disassociative, to some extent, there is a tacit endorsement of content unless there is a control. A mechanism in which they can say this is not us and if you bring it up to us we will get rid of it and they actually do it okay this is so we want so hold on control. stop right there so we so that's the point then right that when the content when the person who owns the platform doesn't like the contents that's there then they have the right to remove it i mean that's 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 obvious otherwise you wouldn't be able to do things like run a chat server or a forum without getting sued left, right, and center, mm. or wind up being, you know, liability becomes a problem because prior to this arrangement existing for for um, user-generated content hosting, it used to be that those hosts would be sued for the stuff that their users did all the time. The reason why things like, you know, I don't want to bring it up, but like Section 230 exists, mm -hmm. is because people used, because companies used to be sued out of existence because of right, what right. people yeah, and, don't have were yeah. doing. L let me, so let me reframe this a little bit. I believe that the internet is is simply makes you more of what you already are. If you're a kind, loving person uh, who really enjoys loving on other people, then the internet is going to is going to be a tool for it to help you be more of that kind of person. And if you're the kind of person that is filled with hate and wants to hurt other people, the internet is a tool that allows you to do that. Don't we, to a certain extent, just have a responsibility to lead by example, not engage in that kind of stuff, and to a certain degree, not exalt acknowledge its existence and if we did that wouldn't the algorithms automatically make those people irrelevant isn't it only because people are interested in that kind of thing and gravitate towards uh, some of those negative things that that cause it to be a problem in the first place i'm all for human optimism noah but i think the last 150 years of human history itself is enough of a sample size to say humans at a very large set don't necessarily do that unless they're guided to do the right things. And one of the ways you do that, I mean, it's kind of, it's not a great way to say it, but like one way you do that is by, you know, pushing people to see positive examples rather than negative ones. And this is an aspect of things that we've had, as you said, with television, with radio, with newspapers, where there's, you know, a gatekeeper or a guardian or some sort, you know, whatever term you want to use that, takes you know inputs and tries to turn them into something constructive for user generated content platforms like facebook and twitter parlor uh other things you one of the uh trade off one of the trades that has been made for supporting this platform is they attempt to try to to work off of human uh the optimistic side of humanity and it they get disappointed constantly over and over and over and so at some point, there has to be a balance where you say, all right, we're going to let this go out and then we're going to try, you know, we'll give people the tools to be able to report and try to, you know, help us make it so that it is sustaining a positive attitude rather than a negative one. But at the end of the day, as you said, some people just want to have the world burn and there are enough of those people that amplify it and machine algorithms and AI and all that stuff, they learn from inputs fundamentally and patterns. And the problem is humanity is twisted. There, no, it, it the is problem is humanity and bad and the bad side tends to, tends to win out for a lot of this amplification. 
because <laughs> leaders. Well, so I, I, I would take that to a certain extent. I would tell you that I think where we eventually get to is that people continually choose themselves over other people. And that is the, that, that selfish nature of humanity, I think, is fundamentally what is that's the core flaw. I think what where that comes out is when that person is given access to the Internet and all and particularly the private access to the internet we see a lot of keyboard warriors right people come out and and they're more harsher than they would be they they type things they would never say to someone's face and that leads me back to again i just i want i ask the question does technology are we not just seeing technology making people more of who they already were and the algorithms simply reward the fact that because people are like you said to a certain degree, want to focus on misery. When bad things happen, they click on it more. When they click on it more, it tells the computer show more of it. When it says show more of it, the more people try to compete in that space because if I can post a more shocking video or if I can show something more depraved than the last person, that will get more clicks. That will drive more interest. And it becomes this vicious circle that erupted into real violence where real people lost their lives this week. Yeah, but... Uh I would also like to point out that though that those uh, select few that chose to go into the capital to, to protest are not representative of the whole entire event that happened during no, that day. No, of course day. not. Yes, only and a small um, handful of them. Yeah, look, yeah, I, totally. Like and, any organization. And a, and a lot of people have been feeling like over the past couple of years that some that some of these larger platforms are suppressing their viewpoints to the point that they need to go to other outlets but if those outlets are not provided and and or not available to them where else can they express it i would say so that I actually comes into something that i would like to see from all of the major cloud providers these user agreements they can change them pretty much at will they are not clear and concise and you know this is what we do allow this is what we don't allow i would like to see the cloud hosting providers provide a very clear this is what we allow this is what we don't allow and we will notify you if that changes and part of because that makes it so people can choose a platform that they know isn't going to kick them off or if it's going to they have full heads up I think it's a larger systemic problem with large companies, you know, i.e. Google, Facebook, Amazon, et cetera, regardless, not just in hosting, but also social media platforms, because they write their terms of service in a way that they can interpret them pretty much however they choose. So Tiny9696 in the chat room uh, brought something up. He said, shouldn't we accept the fact that cloud providers uh, – are, should we not accept the fact that cloud, that they're cloud providers and be aware that they can decide to pull the plug quickly under business terms? That would be my answer to you. I think that at a certain point, the AWS didn't write their terms of service with Parler in mind. They just wrote their terms of service to be in the best interest of their business. They just don't want a bunch of people to start boycotting AWS because that's where the hate servers are hosted or whatever, right? So I think to a certain degree, they're responding to the situation. And what, what, what well, you're I mean, asking, it's also... It's also an aspect of market power because AWS controls a large share of cloud of cloud hosting, and them show, showing their muscle in terms of, hey, we're well, the that's big. Disingenuous. That's disingenuous because here's the problem with saying because they're big, this is a problem. What about the small guy? What about the LinuxDelta.com or anything else that takes user generated content? If they're smart, they're going to have terms of service that make it so that if there is something objectionable or problematic for them, they'll want the power to remove it. And by the way, most of these service providers, it's the big ones that actually do the right thing whenever they change their terms of service. They send you an email every time. I promise you nobody reads them, but they're there. And it's the smaller ones that tend to not do that. They try to go by subterfuge. So using bigness or large scale or whatever isn't <clears throat> itself isn't itself enough to say whether it's good or bad. The real question you should be asking yourself is what would it be like if I had to make that decision? If I had to sit down and deal with the potential fallout of either side of that decision tree? Because if you can't answer that question and tell me that you would stand by it regardless of lawsuits, regardless of potential uh, other issues that could happen, 
then you don't really have a place. It just may not be the hill that you they want to die on. Uh, let me ask. Okay, let me let me shift the, to 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 this a little bit. One of the solutions that has been proposed here has been to use something like a filter system in Matrix, where you people can say whatever they want, but users on the other end can selectively choose what they want to view. And this has been uh, submitted by Matthew, the 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 uh, the lead of of Matrix, as a potential solution to combating harmful content on the internet what do you guys think is that a solution well what what parameters would that filter be under i mean any parameters a filter is set cannot be satisfactory to the whole so the way the way that it was proposed to work in matrix was based on a reputation system and so the idea is that you would have a, a reputation each server could give a it could have a reputation that server has tends to have decent users that server has to tend has tends to have less desirable users and in these categories. And so if you care about that category, then you allow that, uh, then you don't allow that content to federate to you. If you do mind that kind of content, you, you don't allow it, whatever the, the, the right way to say that is. Uh, does that, does that address your concerns about trying to amplify good content and, and remove bad content while leaving the control in the hands of the end user? Well, I guess, sort of. So this this is analogous to the feature where when you, in Twitter, you know, for example, I'm using Twitter because it's the closest, you know, analog I have that, that actually has something like this, um, where if you report tweets and then block the user, you stop seeing it. Here's the problem with that method. It doesn't stop anyone else from seeing it. It doesn't stop the amplification effect. It doesn't stop any of that. The only way to cut that off is to actually disconnect them somehow. But isn't the Noah's, isn't the, isn't the matrix suggestion, the more people that block that, the the higher up on the negative ladder that would go, and then sooner or later your server would stop federating that? It wouldn't ever completely stop federating, but it may only federate to people that had a wide open server. I guess my point is, if somebody is setting their server to say, I want to hear all of the traffic, I don't want anyone's voice to be suppressed no matter what it is they say, if there are two people on the internet that want to have that conversation, I don't, regardless of what that conversation, and I don't have to know what the content is to be able to say this, regardless of what that conversation is, I don't think I have a, I have a right to tell somebody else they can't exchange those ideas or have that conversation. I'm more than happy to come out and, and explain to them why I strongly disagree with them or why I think that I could reason with them to, to make them see another way, but I wouldn't want to prevent them from having that conversation. It, it would be just like uh, being in a, in a room. And uh, children being in the room and two people having a an adult conversation. I don't want to stop you guys from having your conversation. Please go in the other room. My kids are in here playing. Yeah, yeah, That's basically. Kind of what you're saying. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to allow it in, in my space. But you're welcome to do that. And I, you know, as I, I, I. I work at a radio station part time, and so I, I, you know, we we cover a lot of uh, the political stuff, and so I do this show on Tuesday nights, and so we talk a lot about tech things. And today, those worlds met because. As I'm watching this unfold, so many lessons that we have been talking about since day one of this program in 2017, we went on the air and said, hey, there is a better way to host your technology. There's a reason you want to host your technology. And today uh, and, and this last week has really exemplified if your ideas are unpopular enough, then you start to lose access to major po components of the Internet. And I'm not taking a side. I don't agree or disagree with with one side or the other. I'm just saying from a from a pure technical perspective standpoint this is unprecedented and we should be aware of this because today it may be a message that you agree with should be taken off the internet but tomorrow it might not be tomorrow it might be the very thing that you believe to be true and that's going to be the thing that is going to is, is somebody is going to try to to take off the internet I, I i don't believe that the answer to too much speech is to limit speech i think the answer to too much speech is more free speech but has anybody in this room uh, thought about looking at things like Mastodon Social, which, by the way, and I want to be clear, there's Mastodon has come out with kind of the, a lot of people are having an incorrect reputation of Mastodon on the internet. Say, hey, that's a bunch of illegal content, stuff like that. Actually, Mastodon.social specifically bans content um, that has you know anything to do a whole bunch of disgusting stuff. Really, I don't have to necessarily go down the list, but they limit a bunch of that content on Mastodon.social. They just, if you want to go spin up your own Mastodon instance, then you can do whatever you want there. Um, does that, does that work? 
I mean, as techno as technologists ourselves, we would be pro prone to try to experiment with alternative platforms that seem interesting. It's the big concern of mine is to the normal people who don't ha necessarily have that technical ec technical mindset to use those fringe services, so to speak. Well, the the Here, thing. Go ahead. The, the so the issue with. The, the federation concept, and, and this is one of the big weaknesses about federation we don't ver talk about very much. Federation is infinitely bypassable. Any content that comes through, you know, let's say you have a server and you don't like the con of server A and you see server B and you don't like the content of server B. Somebody on server C likes B and federates with A. So it means that there is no way to prevent the content of B from landing in server A, because it can come through B to C to A. And this is the downside of federation <laughs> and the upside, right? It, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter which way you swing this. This is, this is both the upside and the downside. From a perspective of trying to keep an environment clean and trying to, prom to try to um, not promote views that are actively dangerous or bad, and, and there is, some universal definition of bad that has been agreed upon for the last several decades, like anti-Semitism is considered bad. These yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into any, I want to stick to the, I want to stick to the technical stuff. I don't want to get too lost in the weeds of the, of the actual specific examples, but uh, you know, why, why would we not focus on the user's ability to limit content rather than focus on the speaker's ability to put it on the internet in the first place? Because the problem is policy and technology are intertwined and everything related to how people communicate with each other and what they communicate with is a reflection of how we want to develop technology to manage that. Mm. You can't have one without the other. If you try to dis if you try to split the two, you wind up in a situation where you cannot build good solutions to have effective communication. Because you don't understand your users. Exactly. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, regardless of what ends up happening, I, I was it shocking to anybody that self-hosted solutions never really came up in the mainstream media? I mean, I would think to a certain extent there has to be a guy, right, that's like, this is my opportunity. Hey, Mr. President, I can self-host this thing. Look what I can do. Like, I would be that guy if I was worried. Like, does that guy not exist? And did that surprise anybody? It was briefly mentioned that uh, the Trump was going to host its own website, but it disappeared in the blink of an eye well you know uh a certain um person hosted her own email server and you saw where that went yeah i suppose that doesn't you know and the, the thing is and that's maybe a great place to wrap the discussion there but like they they it's because people don't understand the technology right it's because they go into this without un, not understanding the technology and i it was an in, it was interesting this week i as an honorable mention I couldn't find enough about this story. I'm just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but TeamSpeak 5 is reported to be switching over to the Matrix protocol for their chat. Now, I've never used TeamSpeak. I never will use TeamSpeak. Mumble's way better. It's very cool that another company is on the Matrix bandwagon. But this week, somebody asked they, in the, in the uh, Geek Lab, they said, why did Noah switch to uh, Matrix? He said that he switched over to EMS, the hosted version. But he never explained why. And the reason we we started with just a list on a whiteboard of what our requirements were and what we wanted out of a communication system. We had right up at the top end and encrypted um, and that right off the bat ruled out a lot of the big players. Um, but then the other thing that ruled out just about all of them and down to just the open source ones, obviously, was we wanted the ability to self host it at some point and so that we could move off of uh, a hosted infrastructure. And this week exemplifies I made the decision back in august september somewhere there but it actually went into effect in january um we knew we wanted to self-host it precisely because you just can't predict what the internet is is going to be upset about and what is going to what's going to cost you that server so i i we want to be able to do that uh, but it really came down to a couple of things pricing and federation uh there is i don't know how much cheaper you can get team communications uh uh 
paid for, but it's like two bucks per user uh, hosted by Element. When we actually set the system up, I explained to Element what it is I wanted to do. I explained to EMS what it is I wanted to do and that eventually I wanted to self-host it. They, uh, we set up an encrypted chat. They sent me my server signing key. So I have all of the infrastructure I need to spin the server up myself if I want to do it. By the way, they offer that service so that you can just pay them to move it over for you. And then in the following weeks, after we switched over to it, obviously we started recommending it for our clients and as they switched over, there was the the added benefit of one, we can communicate with, with them, which is very nice. The other thing is there were legitimately some use cases that element was the only thing that fit the bill. And that was certainly the case in a lot of the medical environments, because now they had the uh, opportunity for the, the, you know, the pacer reps that work for one company and the, 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 you know, doctors who work for one hospital to talk to the, the scheduling people that work for another hospital. And all of these places can communicate and talk, uh, on, on a system. It's absolutely fantastic. And this is all being done uh, thanks to Element. Um, so all of those things are ultimately why we made the switch. Um, and the fact that you can just pay Element to host it for you. And it then it feels like any other service that a business had. And, you know, we are an IT service company. We manage other people's IT service environments. That means we're not a communication specialist company and we shouldn't be managing our own communication. Uh, and so we're happy uh, thrilled actually to pay them for that because and it works blazing fast. I don't have enough good things to say about EMS. Hey, if you'd like to find more, we have the show notes at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Thanks to people in the community. It is filling out. We have timestamps, links to all of the articles and references we talked about in the show. We'll see you next Tuesday, 6 p.m. Central.